right? Um, so I'm Deborah James. I'm from the LSE Anthropology Department, um, and I think some of you here I know. But um, welcome to all of you for this wonderful event of um, the book launch of, of Mukulika Banerjee. And so um, the just let me check the order. Have we decided who's speaking after you? Um, I think Professor Das, uh, uh, maybe first Thomas and yeah. then Professor Das. Is that okay or? Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. All right. So um, we're here to launch and talk about the book by Mukulika, my colleague at LSE, um, Banerjee. Um, the book is called Cultivating Democracy. Now, Muku's been at LSE for quite some time. Before that, she was at UCL. Her first book was The Path and Unarmed, Opposition and Memory in the Northwest Frontier. And since then, she's been becoming more and more interested in cultural meanings of democracy in South Asia, and especially elections. And that's what her new book, Cultivating Democracy, is about. It's an anthropological study of the relationship of formal political democracy and the cultivation of active and citizenship in one particular rural setting in West Bengal. Um, which she studied between 1998 and 2013. So I'm going to I'm going to hand over to Mukulika first to talk about uh, the book, and then I'll then I'll introduce the other two speakers um, in turn. So over to you, Mukulika. Thank you very much, uh, Deborah, and uh, a big hello and welcome to everyone uh, here. I see lots of uh, friendly faces lots of students, ex-students, colleagues, friends, uh, family. Um, so a big welcome and thank you for making this time uh, to, to be here with us today. Um, thank you also to Deborah, who is a woman of many seasons because she's running the department at the moment. She's head of department. Uh, the music you heard was the band that she created when she was head of department the last time still going we still have the music to enjoy she's chairing the ref panel for anthro and she makes the time to make sure that when a colleague writes a new book there's a launch event so i'm very grateful and very appreciative of this kind of uh, collegiality thank you deborah um, i will say more about my two commentators today uh, as i go along perhaps during the discussion but here just briefly to uh, mark my, again, my appreciation, my gratitude uh, to Professor Veena Das, who uh, taught me anthropology as a grad student uh, when I first encountered the discipline straight from English literature, came to Delhi School of Economics, Professor, professor Das was my professor. Um, and we have sort of stayed in touch uh, over all these years. Her work has been a constant inspiration though. Um, and I'm really honored that uh, she will be talking about her impressions of the book. And I'm not a little bit nervous uh, about, this is a little bit like handing in your tutorial in Professor Das's office and then waiting to be sent away to go and think about it all again and write it afresh. So we'll see whether it is like that. So I hope I, I beg all your support. Um, and Thomas, Thomas Hansen, of course, is, um, you know, for, for many anthropologists, certainly for me, uh, absolutely foundational to thinking about democracy in India as an anthropologist, how to um, engage with political theory, with Tocqueville, with ideas of democratic culture and democratic institutions. It is so part of my intellectual DNA, thinking about democracy in India, that, uh, Thomas's work, that it's not always um, uh, verbalized, but it's absolutely present. So when Deborah asked who uh, could we invite to commentate on the, on the book, um, Professor Das and Professor Hansen were really my uh, ideal uh, candidates for, for the reasons that I said. So uh, thank you really for, uh, for doing this and taking the time in the middle of what I know is a busy teaching semester for both of you. So I'll do uh, what I so it's five past uh, five, and, and we want to wrap this whole event up by 6.30, so you know, an hour and a half, including the Q&A and so on. So what I thought I'd do for the benefit of um, all of you who haven't had a chance uh, to read the book or flick through it, um, I thought I would give you a little summary 
Um, I might keep it quite brief and perhaps we could come back to it. Deborah just said she'd done a book launch for one of her books where she didn't talk about the book at all. So I wonder whether anything I say might be too much. Um, so I will try and strike a balance and speak for about 20 minutes or so and then uh, hand over to the two esteemed commentators for their comments and then we can have a discussion and take questions and so on. So uh, I will uh, just talk you through some slides. Um, This may be because I was playing music here. Yeah. Okay. So, um, this is the book. Uh, for those of you who have uh, seen it, it's on the poster. It's out now, uh, finally. Um, first thing to say about uh, the book is that it has democracy in the title. But when a political anthropologist, when a social anthropologist, studies democracy. We study, uh, study democracy in two registers. One is we study democratic institutions and we study democratic culture. And my attempt here is really to pay equal attention uh, to both these things. I must provide a footnote here because for many years, especially all the years that I've been at LSE, 13 years it has been now, um, because of my interest in elections, both uh, Indian elections, but also elections anywhere that I've uh, watched and tracked with students studying political anthropology with me. Um, my interest in elections is very much part of a wider interest in democracy. The study of the 2009 elections, which was the national elections in India, that resulted in the book Why India Votes, uh, which was a development of the 2007 article, Sacred, Sacred Elections, is something that a lot of people associate uh, with my work and, and understandably that's what I have uh, published. But it is important to uh, just point out, I think at this stage, that my interest in elections is very much the result of finding that a lot of people in India vote in very large numbers, trying to understand it as an anthropologist and then doing ethnographic research to see elections in context, to see it alongside other social institutions in society, and therefore to see elections in, uh, in a way that when voters showed up to uh, vote at a polling booth, we recognized them as a person who was also a farmer, she was a mother, she may like mango pickle, she might be quite pious. There's so many other things that make up the subjectivity, the personhood, of the person we see as the voter. And that's why my interest in elections has always been anchored in this wider interest in society. And finally, this book that's been a long time coming uh, is able to present these two registers simultaneously. It's a, it's a long arc that the book covers of 1998 to, to 2013. Uh, and during this, there have been really three big top line changes in this setting in West Bengal in India. And I'll talk about them in a minute. Um, thirdly, I just want to highlight the fact that uh, the Manchester School, which we don't teach in LSE very much, uh, and many people don't actually, some students may or may not read Gluckman uh, and Victor Turner for ritual. I'm very persuaded and really as almost a post facto reflection on how I've done this research, yeah, it has a lot of resonance. Uh, with the Manchester School of Anthropology, and we can talk about this more uh, later. And so finally, I want to talk about uh, the anthropology of democracy, of course, but also what the anthropological study of an democracy does to our understandings of politics itself. How we understand politics, not just an agonistic uh, exercise, but also Anthropology of Democracy studies both institutions and uh, democratic culture. So 
on the institutions, just to remind you, we're talking about elections, formal citizenship, local government, legal rights, etc. Uh, but we are also interested in democratic culture, which is all the other stuff that goes on in social life, kinship, religion, economy, um, which anthropologists are so good at capturing and studying. But I see them as much as uh, sites for the cultivation of political values or values that are useful for political life. And therefore, this democratic culture, in order for a culture to be demo democratic, uh, the need for civility, the need for fraternity to create social and political, uh, social and economic democracy is, is uh, very high. And it is therefore trying to see the relationship between electoral and inter-electoral temporalities within the same frame. That's the exercise that has been conducted. Uh, my fieldwork location has, has been uh, this place in, in uh, West Bengal, in the district of Birpum. This is the big uh, metallic road that divides the two villages or connects them. Um, and these are the two uh, villages, Madanpur and Chishti, uh, where I've been going back pretty much every year since 1998 um, at regular intervals. So I told you there were going to be three uh, arcs, three big uh, stories of change. One is the story of paddy and paddy cultivation and the increasing unfeasibility of paddy cultivation, the green revolution turning brown, as, as some people have put it. Uh, so from growing two paddy crops, a uh, high yielding variety and the traditional swarna paddy to absolutely no cultivation of brown fields in some years. Um, there is a story of land reform, which I won't go into here, but uh, very important to say that the communists, when they first came into power, um, and this is a story of their reign from 1977 to 2013, the communists introduced very early on in their tenure a program of land reform which had quite serious knock-on effects not only on ownership um, of land, on wages, on agricultural work, but also on notions of dignity, which are very germane to my argument. And what happened to caste is again a complicated story, but a very interesting story. But there was a rebalancing of hierarchies which was fascinating to track. The paddy, harvest, the paddy cultivation and also wheat in between the two paddies in, in some years gives me, of course, the title of the book. And it, at, it allows me to think quite um, closely about cultivation as, again, an activity in two registers. One is the act of cultivation that makes this an agrarian society of a particular kind, but also what uh, cultivation as an ethical activity is, what temporality it encodes, uh, and what values it relies on. So the ideas of vigilance, of patience, of uh, warding off pests, of care, and, and really hope. Every cultivation cycle is a cycle of hope in a way that is quite, again, germane to the democratic pro uh, project. <clears throat> The second big arc is the one up around Islam and being Muslim in these villages. Um, these villages are mostly Muslim. The uh, inhabitants are mostly Muslim. They celebrate uh, Muharram uh, and the two Eids. And I write about one of these Eids in, um, in, in the book. It's one of the four events. I'll come to that in a minute. But let me just give you a sense of the Muslim male figure in India, or indeed the female, is such a um, precarious um, figure at the moment in India. And a lot, of course, can be said uh, about this. But I wanted you to just see these images, because these are young Muslim men in, in and around my villages. This is the big contest they have every Muharram. Um, and the Indian flag, the cricket strip, the jeans are um, 
are exactly the uniform of the youth amongst them in the way that they are uh, for the rest of, of the country. But they're very important to the argument that we will make later, maybe uh, with commentators. Sorry. I shouldn't have played that because that's a very emotional moment for me at the moment because this was in 2019 and it's precisely the loyalty and the Indianness of these Muslims that is so severely under threat in India at the moment. But we'll move on, we'll come back to these issues, sorry. The third, um, the third, yeah, the one thing to say about Islam though is that it is a story of a certain kind of South Asian Islam, which I, I know I, you know, just knowing several, several people who are on this uh, meeting at this meeting today have written about uh, South Asian Islam and its syncretism, its complete relaxed rules of observance, etc., that it has been associated with, slowly morphed into a much more uh, strict reformist Islam uh, that was brought back by young men traveling to far flung madrasas. Um, and um, increasing proselytizing by these groups in, in West Bengal. But um, again, we can talk about this more later. But what was interesting, having studied these villages over 15 years, was to see this transformation where young boys who I used to help with their homework 15 years later had in the meanwhile gone away, come back, and now were telling me off uh, as for traveling alone, for not covering up enough, uh, for not talking in appropriate ways, still their mothers had to hush them up and so on. But this is something that one has experienced firsthand in these villages. Now the third arc of change uh, is the political story, which is a fascinating story. It's, it's one of the reasons why I chose West Bengal, uh, mainly because I'd never lived in the state, but I spoke the language, so it was ideal to do anthropological research. Um, in 1998, West Bengal was completely dominated by a coalition of uh, communist parties called the Left Front. And uh, the Left Front was absolutely um, preeminent. They were uh, no tolerance, there was zero tolerance for any political opposition being even mentioned in the village. When I first entered it, the comrade was the all important figure and uh, nobody could even talk about any other political party, um, except at every election when you counted the vote, vote shares, uh, the Congress used to get quite a healthy vote share, sometimes up to 40% uh, in West Bengal, even all those years when the left front was very dominant. Slowly, in 1998 onwards, exactly at that time, the fledgling new Trinamool Congress was formed, led by Mamata Banerjee, no relative, uh, who was then seen to be this sort of insurgent uh, challenge to the Communist Party and the rather patrician Bhadralok uh, leadership of the, of the Communists that she was in stark contrast to. Uh, and then literally from nowhere they gained ground and by 2013, in 2011 they won the state level elections and in 2013 they won the local elections. And that was the real consolidation of power. When you win panchayat elections, then you really uh, won power. And so the book covers this period between 1998 and 2013. Of course, my visits have continued beyond that. So I'm able to uh, write from the present, in a sense, if uh, uh, through the book, in the book. The this is always uh, fun to share because this is what Communist Party offices used to look like in, in West Bengal when I traveled around in 1998 trying to decide where to do my field work and I would go into CPM offices everywhere. And this, this is the um, pantheon of leaders that all uh, parties, party offices had. The mural, the wall art or walling as it's called in Bengal uh, was phenomenal during the elections. This kind of art was everywhere. Um, sadly, the election commission got very strict during my fieldwork and, and uh, less and less of this kind of, you know, this was seen to be defacing walls and therefore this had to stop. If only the election commission 
had such high standards even now about much worse crimes, but that's another story. Um, and then there was the Congress, uh, always the family that uh, was increasingly irrelevant in West Bengal because of Mamata Banerjee setting up uh, Srinamul Congress. Uh, again, great um, tradition of political satire and lampooning and jokes, and again, a lot of public art that was produced during elections that made them uh, such exciting events. Now, the role of the Election Commission of India is important um, um, and was absolutely important in the uh, uh, late 90s when I started and uh, right up until uh, 2013 when this book ends. And I, Christoph is here and others, scholars have, have written about the Election Commission and its phenomenal um, hold on uh, standards. Uh, of conducting elections in India, where uh, while obviously not flawless, elections in India could be, ha could be said to be genuinely free and fair to a large extent for large numbers of people, which was part of the reason why uh, voter turnouts were so high. And this kind of, of hoarding in or by the side of streets was very common. So you'd see uh, the election commission encouraging people to get out and vote. Um, the switch in 2011, when the Vidhan Sabha or the state level elections were held, when the left front lost power to uh, Trinamul, uh, Trinamul made it very clear in their posters. This one says, Bodla Noi Bodul Chai. We don't want revenge, we want change. Uh, it's a play on the word uh, that sounds very similar in Bangla. And this was in fact, a, a dream, a wish rather than the, uh, the truth. And uh, really, West Bengal's uh, politics since then has been this tension between uh, revenge and change, you could say. And we can talk about this more if anyone wants to. But going to vote was an important activity. And in advance of uh, any election at any level, uh, this was a very common sight. People in the village, this is taken, these are my friends in the village who would huddle around voters' list and make sure their names were there and you know everything was in order so that they could show up to vote on polling day. So finally, uh, just to say, uh, to uh, recap what the book really says, the intervention it is making, um, the first point that I've already made that a political anthropologist studying um, democracy uh, is interested, she's interested both in elections and the temporalities in between elections to see not just what is happening, but also how they constitute each other. So the afterlife of the election in social life uh, can be tracked as indeed uh, social dynamics in between elections affect the way people behave at uh, elections and on election day. So therefore, in order to understand democracy, it's really important to study these non-electoral phases as well. And therefore, any discipline that kind of disappears from the field when there is no election and sort of lands up uh, misses most of the story. And that's why we are unable to explain what is going on, uh, why, um, why elections um, why results happen the way they do? Why do people change their minds? Why did people, you know, in the UP elections, there are massive elections going on in India at the moment, and the most populous state is going to the polls. And, and you know, the first phase was held last week, and uh, the turnout was very low. And it's a puzzle. You have to explain why, and unless you have been there before studying the societies, you really would not be able to just speculate. And oh, you can speculate, but it's almost certainly to be inaccurate. Um, as any anthropologist will know, that you know, a village life has many, uh, many ritual moments, many um, extraordinary, transcendent uh, events, as I call them, uh, inspired very much by Vina Das's work. Um, but I look at four of these events to uh, see what they do for democracy, what kind of values they uh, they create. And 
democratic values to my mind are not uh, parachuted in alongside uh, institutions only yes institutions bring certain ideas of democratic behavior and democratic culture but really for it to take seed for the soil to be nourished for it to flourish uh, and for us to be able to cultivate uh, democratic cultures um, these values have to be uh, created in non-political events as much as political one. And therefore, the ethnographic method, which is uh, which we write so much about, uh, and that is implicit in this uh, book, um, tries to capture these range of different kinds of happenings in a village life to see what they teach us about democracy. Um, I call these social imaginaries, uh, borrowing Charles Taylor's term. And I show how each of these four events, a scandal, the harvest, and Korbani, and then an election, show us, uh, generate uh, certain values that are uh, productive in creating democratic culture. And I won't go over them individually. We can come back to them later. I'm very conscious of the time. Um, so this tension between political institutions and political culture is really, I would argue, what is being captured in the Constitution of India through the use of both words, democracy and republic. India is a sovereign democratic republic. And the word democracy is doing the work of indicating political democracy of democratic institutions. But the word republic is really there to show that the project of democracy is incomplete if we leave it to that formal political uh, level, that it has to be participatory, it has to be social, it has to be anchored in society, and it has to be collective. It's not just about individual freedoms. There is a social project there in creating a certain kind of uh, democratic culture. And therefore, you need to create from scratch new kinds of solidarities. And that is what politics is about. So it's not just about the competition of an election. It is also the cooperation, uh, the vigilance of a Republican citizen. Um, so really, that's uh, we have, I think I've covered most of these already, um, except maybe just I should just highlight that because I mentioned the Manchester School, I really take, I present these four events as social dramas. And whether they work or not, we'll find out from our commentators today. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. Can you hear me? OK, great. Thanks, Mukulika. That was really very interesting and gave us a good outline of, of what the book's about. Um, I'm, so now I'm going to introduce Thomas Blom Hansen, who's our first sort of commentator. He is the Reliance Diru, sorry, Dirubai Ambani Professor of Anthropology at Stanford. Um, he's an anthropologist of political life, ethno-religious identities, violence, and urban life in both South Asia and Southern Africa. And a lot of his early fieldwork was done in these very tumultuous times and eventually resulted in both his book, The Saffron Wave, and another book, um, Wages of Violence. He most recently wrote a book, um, Melancholy of Freedom, Social Life in an Indian Township in South Africa, which is more my sort of area of, of interest and, and expertise. And um, so he's, he's very, very well placed to comment on Mikulika's book today. So welcome, Thomas, and over to you. Well, thank you very much, and uh, thanks for inviting me to this event. Uh, I am uh, uh, I'm thrilled, actually, to uh, to have had the opportunity to uh, to read this book, and and um, I want to thank you, Mukulika, for for uh, sharing this sort of uh, what obviously is a kind of labor of love. Uh, it's 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 a very well written, well structured, um, well narrated uh, account. Uh, that's uh, uh, a very rich ethnography that's uh, laid out very clearly. And um, 
I think what you you show us in this book is is how the larger sort of uh, political, cultural, and economic dynamics of of India in the last few decades are sort of uh, washed over, influenced, and uh, and structured what you have seen in these two villages of Chisti and Madhampur, as you call them. And so, so it's in that sense, it's 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 a very um, uh, there is something for for a lot of us, also people who are not necessarily in, uh, interested in primarily interested in political anthropology because the stories and the the social dramas that you are depicting are really a, a rich array of, of things from the questions of of justice around the sharing of harvest questions of religion of the transformation of islam uh, and, and of course the question of elections and how the political is played out so um i want to say uh, 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 I, i'm also before i i, I get to my comments i want to say also thank you for giving us a study of uh, of uh, West Bengal that's predominantly about Muslim communities. There aren't that many books about that, uh, with that foreground, that very large uh, uh, chunk of, of people in, in that state. Now, I have a, a couple of comments. I'll try to limit myself to about 10 minutes. I'm just gonna time myself. Um, so uh, so your book is, is in some ways a response as you also frame it yourself to Ambedkar's provocation for in the early 50s that democracy was but a mere topsoil uh, in a deeply anti-democratic society that is India. And you show very well, I think, that the, the transformations that have taken place in these two villages, uh, uh, how they are both locally grounded as well as conditioned by these larger uh, dynamics. And you have also, uh, you show very well how elections are and this has, of course, been a biting interest of yours for, for some time, are so integral to this story in a way that's often not uh, uh, shown. And I, I think that's one of the great strengths of the book. You also show that, that, that notions of rights and democratic citizenship and dignity are central to this story. This is something that resonates with many uh, of us doing work in this field. Um, but at the same time, and here is maybe my first observation, your story, especially towards the end of the book, uh, ends on a much sadder and confusing note uh, as, the, uh, as you tell the story of the fall of the left, um, the, 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 the fall of the CPIM as a dominant force and the rise of the Trinamool Congress, you, you show that this a newly elected Trinamool candidate and his supporters are actually unable to assume office because of the legal cases against them in the village and probably in the district. Uh, and, you, and you're telling at the end, towards the end of the book, uh, it's as if the village is almost like politically dead. And that was for me a kind of uh, both interesting, but also uh, begged maybe more questions around. So what, what does that say about this sort of, otherwise you're quite optimistic narrative about the cultivation of these broader publics, the cultivation of sentiments of participation, of dignity, of, of being part of a larger political world. And then it seemed that it fell apart quite quickly. Um, so I would like to hear you talk about that a little bit more and reflect on that. So that's the first sort of, uh, and maybe in, in that's another thing you, of course you can't comment on everything, but you know, there's also been this recent and quite sustained um, support for the BJP across West Bengal, uh, something of course that I would expect has not been very prominent in those two villages, but still, what, how has that played into the sort of, uh, uh, you can say, um, efflorescence of, of, of political life that you depict uh, and, and, and how does, does that inform this new turn that has surprised a lot of people, the, just how much support they were able to get and so on and so forth. It's not a, a big point. I just want to hear what you have to say about this. On a more conceptual level, as, uh, um, I think I, I find your interpretation of, you, you have a, a sort of, a, a, one of your conceptual hinges is the notion of what is the political. The political in your interpretation is a field of possibility and transformation and possibility it may be uh, you, you invoke uh, 
uh, Machiavelli, at least in Skinner's uh, reading, uh, as and his notion of virtue or, or virtue, public virtue, towards the end. Uh, I read it perhaps a little more in the sense of so, sort of inspired by Hannah Arendt's sense of um, of po uh, politics providing these sort of brief moments of creativity, like when power configurations change and accelerating new possibilities tend to appear. And you see this at several points in your story. Uh, but it's, it's, it, you, you have a somewhat, and this is the project, and I understand it, uh, a sort of um, uh, optimistic reading of the possibilities of, of, of this kind of electoral politics to actually transform social relations. At the same time, um, as you also note, and we show uh, ethnographically here and there, uh, uh, electoral politics and this kind of, I mean, this, the whole sort of uh, arena of, of public engagement uh, and, and, um, and, and mobilizing people in the village for different demands or different projects, it's also cruel, it's violent, it's driven by vanity, revenge, ludic desires, petty jealousies of the dominant players. So it's constructive, but it's also dangerously divisive. It's on one hand set apart from the normal rules of everyday life, uh, like the elections are in a very conspicuous way, uh, but in other ways it's not. And this is uh, what you're also showing. And I think that's very useful. So it is a field of possible virtue, but it's also the possibility of its opposite of the self-sacrificing and austere comrade doing good uh, as you show in the beginning, but also the self-enriching and venal comrade towards the end. So all of this is part of the political. So in that sense, the political is both intrinsic to the community. It's also extrinsic. It builds off and depends on and is enacted within local hierarchical structures of kin, caste, and mutual dependency. Yet it's also driven and powered by all kinds of extrinsic connections outside the village, outside the rural setting to the party, the state government funding, and generally the sort of mobile and extra local or orientations and networks of activists. And that is also what drives them in, a, in, in many ways. It's not just cultivating democracy in the village, it's also transforming themselves into something else. And you have some great stories of local activists who radically expanded their horizon and ideas of what they could possibly be by getting involved in communist politics. And at the same time, they remain somewhat stymied at home in the village, not being able to move beyond their dependency on the comrade and on the party. So yes, cultivation of democracy and citizenship happens on the ground, but the conditions of possibility for this to happen are mostly larger processes and extra local processes, it seems to me. So let me ask you a few questions to wrap up with this last theme, which is what are those conditions? Uh, and, and you show many of them. In some ways you can say your story is one of, 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 of new expectations across the board. And one of the, the central dynamics that you show is the, 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 the sort of collapse of the customary power and authority of the Sayyids, the dominant uh, caste group uh, and the land owners, that that power was broken by combination of land reforms uh, and the new configuration of social power, as well as the hollowing out of the general hollowing out of the power of dominant caste that we have seen uh, in other parts of India as well. So the question is, is the social drama and is the cultivation of democracy that you see really emerging out of this underlying process that the Sayyids actually lost power for a host of reasons, that the efforts, their efforts at sharing, uh, showing civility and inclusion of other communities is in some ways a response to this loss of authority and the fact that they have to go and do manual labor in the fields. Yet in your book, the current drama, the political drama that you also depict in so uh, in many details and so well, is still, still about the Sayyids that still dominate the field of politics and political maneuvering uh, and political leadership. So there is a transformation for sure, but how much leveling is there? There is a rebalancing of caste power, as you say, around the harvest, for instance, but it seems less so in the political realm. And compared to other parts of India where Dalits and OBCs dominate local electoral politics, what can we say about this? Uh, um, is the fact that sheikhs, patans, dorms play a much lesser role in the ethnography also uh, reflexive of the fact that they play a much lesser role in the public life of the village as a whole? 
that and you have a story about the new but still modest festival by the dorm community, for instance, that's nothing compared to what the science put on every year. Uh, so is this connected to some extent also to long standing silence and silencing of questions of caste and caste politics and caste identities in West Bengal? Um, these are, um, I think, questions to ask. Um, and my final towards the end here, I just want to um, say a few words about um, to, at the end of your book, again, you, you have an interesting comparison uh, with the populist movement among farmers in, in the US in the late 19th century. And you cite them and, and, and discuss, and there's a lot of fantastic studies of this movement that sought to create uh, separate institutions and associational life, educational schemes, and much else that were autonomous in relation to the state and in relation to dominant social powers of the time. But and 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 you uh, uh, your analogy there is that this is a, a similar kind of burst of social imagination and political energy that you've seen in West Bengal in the last three decades, but. In India and West Bengal, certainly in your telling, it wasn't really autonomy that was sought, was it? It, it was every major improvement in your story. See, uh, it seems to be transacted through public schemes and improvements, and there seems to be much less emphasis on autonomy and the search for any kind of self-government that really drove that kind of populist movement in the U.S. What can we then conclude from that? That popular politics in India may be Indian populism is less about resisting the state and seeking autonomy and more about calling upon the state to be seen by the state as scholars like Adam Auerbach and Lisa Mitchell have argued, for instance. So uh, what, 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 what does that say in terms of, of, of what is the purpose of the cultivation of democracy and the cultivation of, of dignity and participation? And finally, I just want to throw in one last question, which is that that if caste is still a structuring force um, that seems to have not really been addressed very clearly or head on or uh, uh, articulated clearly in the public realm in these local publics, how much can one think of, of or, or even uh, think of public virtue as, as, an, as a term uh, that is efficient uh, beyond uh, what you describe as these sort of uh, dominant caste communities trying to assemble kind of coalitions of supporters. But is it really the case that there is a new and more inclusive public sphere or public, a public that can actually affect transformation uh, on a, in a more durable way? So I'll stop with this uh, uh, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thomas. Um, you've given an absolute sheath full of questions for Mukuriku to answer. Muku, I hope you're going to keep a record of all those because we're going to move on to speaking to Professor Das, and hopefully then you'll you'll have time to address some of these, even if not all of them, at the end. Is that okay? Great. Thank you very much. Um, so now it's my pleasure to invite uh, Professor Bina Das. Uh, sorry, somebody just arrived in the waiting room. Um, um, to, to give us a little talk about the book. Um, Vina Das is the Krieger Eisenhower Professor of Anthropology at Johns Hopkins University. Before this, she taught at Delhi School of Economics, which is where Mukulika first um, encountered her, held a joint appointment also at the new school. She's got very broad research interests and most notable for today's book launch is her interest in how we might treat philosophical and literary traditions from India and also other regions as generative of the theoretical and practical understandings of the world. Um, and she's known for many, many books, um, things like social suffering, violence and subjectivity, remaking a world, life and words, violence and the descent into the ordinary. She's, you know, the list goes on. So I won't sort of list them all here, but uh, it's very, very nice to have you on board, Professor Das, and um, thank you, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to, uh, I was given 15 minutes and I'm going to take uh, those 15 minutes uh, to, um, to put forward um, what I see as um, um, something I found absolutely um, 
you know, breaking from many of the paradigms we've become uh, used to thinking with in, uh, in Mukulika's book. Um, and also the, uh, you know, almost the kind of issues really of uh, several residues one can locate there where um, it kind of um, makes one extremely curious about uh, the possibility of different directions which might, um, where one might move from there. Uh, overall, I found that uh, one really uh, important um, uh, conceptual uh, question that Mukulika raises, which we all know theoretically, which is really that the question of the hyphenated relationship between uh, the between the idea of a democratic repub republic. So really what's the kind of way in which one might think about, um, uh, about this particular hyphenated relationship so that the issue really of what is it to be thinking about uh, both uh, questions of participation in relationship to uh, building up of democratic institutions, not just elections. I think elections are very important and are one of the important social dramas um, that Mukulika locates. But one of the most interesting thing to me is really, you know, what happens um, in between the different kind of elections. I remember this, um, um, one of my own interlocutors who is a um, you know, eighth class kind of person who's uh, studied up to eighth, but is a kind of lower level party worker. Um, at the time of the rise of the Apadmi party asking me, you know, what are the big professors writing about us? Because there was all of this reflections about democracy. And I've made a kind of short summary of uh, various people's writings, which were coming in Indian newspapers. And I gave it to him and I said, you know, a lot of it was how democracy was a complete sham. After all, you know, uh, people could always buy votes and, uh, you know, in any case, you know, where, where uh, how would we think about um, elections in a country where um, there was so much coercion and so on. And interestingly, he said to me, oh, oh, you know, all of these big professors, they get it all wrong. And I said, so why do you think they get it all wrong? He said, you know, those days when you could buy a vote with a bottle of alcohol are really over in one way. And I think that was something very interesting to me as to think, uh, think of a particular problem which has arisen, um, um, and which recently I've um, kind of, try to participate in, to think through, um, which is that because I work also quite a lot with economists and, um, yes, and some political scientists, um, why is it they ask that on the macro level, what we get is always a particular picture in a certain sense of much more dire breakdowns than we get at the micro level when anthropologists are studying it. Is it a disciplinary framing question or is it that there is actually a real difference in terms of how do you move across particular kinds of scales? And I thought that one of the most exciting things that I found in Mukulika's method in a way was the actual ability to move across different scales. That is to say, there was a certain kind of a cascading scales within that in which one could both keep in the frame the idea that the village was actually part of the flows in a certain sense of uh, different kinds, what, uh, what Thomas calls the conditions of possibility, which allow particular formations to appear. Hence, you know, all of those changes that Mukulika locates right at the start, which is, you know, this kind of withdrawal of, uh, um, uh, withdrawal of, or, or withdrawal of the investment in agriculture as such, which is, you know, many people have noted beginning with Akhil Gupta. Um, and what that means both effectively and in terms of, you know, what does it mean for village um, um, for thinking about the village to think that whether agriculture um, uh, moves into directions where behind any continuities, there are actually very severe discontinuities. Um, I think her, uh, 
notion really of, uh, I, I'm a little less sympathetic to the idea and she doesn't actually endorse that, that there's some period when there's huge syncretism within um, uh, South Asian Islam and then that gives way to uh, more um, reform Islam. I think there've always been cross currents of that kind of where living in proximity has produced certain kinds of ways of thinking about Islam, ways in which Islam was inhabited. And while there is no doubt that the, the kind of new, uh, the kind of new <coughs> pressures on Muslim communities have both quite interestingly made them made this sense that we are we really part of this political community, but also allowed new possibilities of saying we are this political community to actually emerge on the part of Muslim communities in India. I find it very very fascinating that um, I think Amrita Ibrahim has a very nice paper where she where one of these men who are documenting uh, the police excesses to. Um, in the case of the uh, Jamia Islamia um, encounter, um, you know, where one of the Muslim men says to who's an activist says to her, um, uh, you know, we Muslims are the daughters-in-law of India. And I found not only the kinship idiom very interesting, but also this idea that this is a very fraught belonging, but it's not as if we cannot take some ways of being responsible for, um, for Indian democracy. Uh, and just working with people now, like, uh, you know, like Wahid Sheikh and people working with the Innocence Network, um, it seems to me very interesting to see how this kind of uh, changes that Mukulika actually identifies and finds a method to see at the um, level of the rural, um, in fact, get transformed, not just in terms of very large macro pictures, but also in terms of the tactics and strategies and affects invested in the country. So starting with that, I think I would um, say, I would want to give you two, two very compelling examples. Um, one is the whole way in which what in my language I would say is um, a tracking of the microphysics of power. So that, you know, uh, asking what is politics could also be reframed as asking what are the various forms of power that are actually circulating? And what are the relationships of these forms, this microphysics of power to tactics and strategies? Um, and there I really found the absolute attention to detail um, quite fascinating in the book. So, you know, even to take, I wanted to make this contrast that um, say something like um, uh, when she's describing this uh, formation uh, of this arbitration, there is a arbitration committee which the comrade who is one of the very major um, players in the village level, and there is an interesting history of how he comes to be um, uh, have the position that he does have. There is, of course, the overall question that how is it that the party came to have this kind of a place where everybody would assume that the party does have a right to, or we do go to the party to say, you know, this marriage has to be arranged or that a transgression has to be happened. And how do we actually deal with that? It becomes part of the affairs of the party at the local level. And having lived in Calcutta, it was very fascinating that even in the urban uh, Calcutta, each street in a certain sense had this certain sense of saying, um, you know, that if, if this is the Trinumal Street, then the Trinumal Street party, local party level workers, not necessarily very big leaders, would have a say in the everyday life of the street, for instance, right? So here, what was very fascinating was to see the kind of deep, um, I don't want to say it's deep history, but a kind of deep digging into what is the kind of um, underground over here, which is enabling these particular characters to do what they're doing. For instance, in the arbitration committee, she shows how the comrade actually puts one person there 
who, uh, uh, who was his uh, patron earlier, whom he had betrayed, whom he had kidnapped, whom he had then got a signature from to say that he would not participate in politics. But th there is a very interesting way in which he is placed to show a certain neutrality, but he knows that there are certain things he can count on because of this very small chain of micro events or the fact that she tracks the kinship relationships, the genealogical relationships, which the comrade had with the families who of the two other men who are actually put into the arbitration committee. Now, this is precisely the kind of thing which gets completely wiped out when we get very, very uh, macro level um, descriptions, but also very macro level concepts like, oh, this is the relationship between kinship and politics. Maybe that is one description, but it doesn't begin to tell you in what kind of way are these kind of uh, small um, um, history of the small events which are remembered in every family, more or less, right, um, uh, are actually becoming part of the way that village politics is organized and related. Uh, so, you know, we could have long discussions to say, is politics as Hannah Arendt imagines it? Is it really um, in opposition to, um, you know, is it one type of action? Is it really the domain of the free? How come uh, Hannah Arendt is so suspicious of the poor and thinks that something like the French Revolution was completely compromised by the um, participation of the poor? that would be one route to go. And it is leading to very disastrous consequences in the sense, um, actually when uh, Thomas was talking about all the everyday life of betrayals and um, animosities and revenge, first I thought he's really talking about Stanford or about you know um, academic life in general, right? So, so nothing surprising about that. But what becomes very interesting to me is the fact that for the anthropologist, that is what allows Bukulika to actually tell us what is the life in a certain sense of these concepts. Whereas if you now look at, you know, this is a big thing in economics to say, uh, cultural economics is going to become the next big field. And if you see over there, something like the Noah will be taken to say, by definition, we know that there's going to be much greater intensity of warfare in uh, societies which were segmentary lineages versus those which did not have segmentary lineages because it com they completely take the words of uh, what the informants are actually telling Evans Pritchard as a hypothetical case, right? So of course, hypothetically, if you ask somebody and say, suppose your, you know, your, um, agnetic relative of this maximal lineage who lives far away from you were in a fight with somebody else, what would you do? And he would say, of course, I will go and fight over there. No actual genealogies are in fact shown over there to say how are decisions actually taken. So there is a very interesting, I think, question over here, um, you know, which is a methodological question that where, when is it that we stop assuming that in, in a way, a particular description that might be given purely in normative terms is actually, you know, that how do we put it in conversation with precisely the kind of tactics of power um, that are so beautifully and the tactics of um, uh, collaborations and the tactics of actually drawing from actual relationships from the past, which come to give a color in a certain sense to a particular decision that would be made. Uh, so that I would say is one way in which it actually restored my faith into thinking that there is still something very important that we as anthropologists can actually do over here, which is that now that uh, suddenly, you know, there are these more powerful disciplines who become very interested in taking up uh, the concepts and in interpreting them, of course, they don't need any mediation from any anthropologist because, you know, they assume that they know much better. And so you get, you in the end, get these kinds of uh, production of these big things, big concepts like assuming that warfare is much more prolonged and intense when there are non-state actors. And 
you know, over here, and I think Thomas is absolutely right on this, that there is a certain question over here of what are the conditions of possibility. So even the conditions of possibility for non-state actors to arise would depend upon the manner in which the state allows that to happen or participates directly in what that happens. And so I think there's something important very methodologically. I'm not 100% sure that I would assume that Turner's notion of social drama quite captures that precisely because Turner is very clear that there is a, you know, a before and a sequel to these uh, social dramas which come up, but we don't actually get that before and after in very many descriptions because it's so compelling to just concentrate on this dramatic thing that happens at that time. Um, so that would be my one question, one, one, you know, one issue that I would like to raise. It's not in the sense of something that, you know, I would say, um, you know, give us, a, give us here and now, um, what would you do with that kind of information? But I think the question of tactics and strategy in relationship to um, power as a nomadic kind of entity would raise this particular question about how much allegiance to put uh, on uh, uh, the social drama model. Uh, the second question that I would have over here is uh, um, the, the question that there is a, uh, there's something interesting there about also about, uh, uh, about deliberation. And because I don't want to go in very great detail, but is there some relation in the manner in which for a particular time, there was, it was possible to have agreements of the sort that one could say, this is something on which we can do bichar, right? And you know, all of these uh, discussions right now about uh, joining up the issues about deliberative democracy to Hebermas's kinds of questions about um, communicative action. Uh, and I'm just wondering whether what you now see is a kind of breakdown of those agreements where, um, you know, where life could continue, even if it was not totally just, there were some aspirations that could be put in. And third, I really enjoyed the emphasis upon possibility for the reason that modality comes so late in the analysis of, um, uh, of the social fields, precisely because one assumes that that is a given, um, that, you know, that what, uh, that because of a certain emphasis on presence and presentism and so on. So I really like that emphasis upon um, possibility, but I wonder whether the methodology for pursuing possibility or the, or the idea of pursuing modality uh, is exactly the same as thinking about social imaginary or whether you think that these actually would require different kinds of modalities. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Um, that was fantastic. So we now have a, a long series of questions um, from Mukiliki to address. Um, Muka, I'm not sure that you'll manage all of them. Um, and we still want to leave a little bit of time for people to ask questions that one or two have already said things in the chat. But um, what I would say is maybe now you could go ahead and respond to some of the things that you would like to. And we'll see then how much time is left over for, for people. Thank you. Um, thank you very much to uh, Thomas and, and Vina for um, for making me read, you know, you write a book and you spend, I didn't rush this one, as you can see. I mean, I took my time writing it and you think you've kind of thought about it from every possible angle. And then you have a book launch discussion like this and realize there's so much more to think about. So thank you. That's exactly why you're here. And thank you again for continuing to inspire. I just want to note, if I may, that uh, two people who are here on the call are uh, absolutely germane to my thinking about politics and political anthropology. There's Yogendra Yadav, uh, uh, and I will talk about his political work in a minute because it's relevant to something that uh, Thomas uh, asked me about, and Jonathan Spencer has joined the call. And again, Jonathan, as I've said to Jonathan, he will find 
his fingerprints all over my argument. And I think Thomas and Vina, who both know Jonathan's work so well, will agree with that. Uh, so I just wanted to acknowledge their presence. Um, the, let me just pick one point that is common to what both of you were saying, and I think it's quite a critical point about conditions and action and what's possible um, um, in the activity of cultivation, because it's such an important part of what the book is trying to convey, uh, what kind of action it is, you know, the point that Vina ended with um, in deliberative democracy is one that is wide open. But before I say that, you know, here to go back to this uh, relationship between institutions and culture, and I hang on to that frame because it also allows a communication with disciplines outside anthropology who are thinking about democracy uh, because it's a recognizable frame for many. Um, and I dare say what is happening in India today, what has happened through my research uh, and right up until the present, uh, is precisely that the conditions of um, creating the possibility of certain kinds of action have very seriously been distorted. And there was a certain kind of distortion that we saw, that I saw in uh, West Bengal uh, under left front rule, where that complete one party dominance for 34 years, winning election after election after election, you know, at an all India level with the BJP's dominance now, it comes as a surprise to some people. Some of us who've studied West Bengal politics at least have some way of understanding it because we've been there in a sense of seeing that kind of dominance, electoral dominance, and the sort of electoral authoritarianism that comes out of electoral dominance um, of, that, of that sort. And here, the democratic institutions actually which again as anthropologists we pay less attention to are really important to follow because I find the fact that people were voting for the Congress in those heydays of the left front really significant you know for me this is not just something that shows up in quantitative data it, it is an indication that people believe that the secret ballot is really secret that this is their chance to express their political allegiances um, that are distinct to the hegemonic force of, of, of the left front in, in that case. And it allows them to be a different kind of citizen in West Bengal at that time, one that is not completely uh, dominated by the hegemonic hold of, of the left front. And it is this imagination that really this is what democracy is about, that I have the right to go and vote for who the hell I want at the ballot box, that keeps alive the imagination of what democratic politics and its possibilities are. And when the conditions and when the external conditions emerge of a new political party, of you know what happens with Nandigram and so on, where they gain ascendancy, that imagination is finds its expression. So I think, you know, to go back to, to what Thomas was asking, I think it is important to look at the conditions for cultivating democracy, for the cultivation, are really often institutional. And, you know, this goes back to uh, the point about what you were asking about caste dynamics as well, that, you know, the reason why the Sayyids uh, treated low caste members of the village with more respect was not because they had lost power. It's because institutional interventions like land reforms or increasing the daily wage labor rates had forced them to, uh, to change how they, um, uh, they behaved with others. So here, you know, the creation of democratic cultures is so dependent on democratic institutions. And I think it's this interdependency that one should not um, ever take for granted. And that's so when you talk about um, about the Farmers Alliance, Alliance of Farmers in the US, um, Thomas, 
you know, I think this is the work that Yogendra and the Sayyuk Kisan Morcha, what they've been doing. I think the parallels, I'm thinking more about this. And I think the parallels are phenomenal because I don't think it is only about, yes, it is about seeking greater um, public goods, greater benefits from the uh, government. But you know, the Alliance of Farmers were also asking for better rates for their crops. They were asking not to be indebted because of the crop clearance system. They were asking to be treated in ways that they could live with dignity and did not have rags on their foot uh, so that they could afford shoes. And that uh, uh, demand for dignity is not a demand from dignity from the government. It is a demand for dignity per se in a way that I think the farmers movement in India has made us think about farmers in a completely uh, different way. And here, I think, I don't know, I, uh, Professor Das will obviously have a different reading of Arendtian action, but I think here this Arendtian notion of uh, politics being about creating solidarity, about coming together, about being able to suppress difference, differences to create solidarities is exactly what we see uh, in play. Um, with Professor Das's, you know, the, the comments, I will think about them obviously a lot more. Um, but is social drama, I think, you know, that point is very well taken. Um, I don't think Victor Turner, Victor Turner is very good on ritual and on, on social drama. I'm not sure he's actually that concerned about the structure, you know, he's very good on the anti-structure. I'm not sure that he's that concerned about structure on either end, as we are in this project at least, and I know I'm not alone in this, that if these events are moments of anti-structure between, uh, interleaved between moments of structure, then uh, the actually Turner is not very helpful at all, I agree, to think about it. But I think the situational analysis of the Manchester School is productive because it forces you to ask questions about uh, about microdynamics between people, about flows of power that that uh, Vida spoke so eloquently about, and how they how one can um, capture them. And also, I dare say, thinking again about um, what politics is you know, to th to think again that politics is not simply about you know it's not the rather pedestrian and commonsensical notion of anything. You know, in India too, we say in in any context, if things get complicated, we say in Hindi, ye zara political hai, you know, which means that there's something wrong with it. It's It's been corrupted. Um, and in the sense that, you know, Thomas has written so eloquently about that idea of, of moral corruption that's come into uh, to, to being a politician. Uh, alongside political entrepreneurship. And in a way, I'm moving away from that uh, reading of politics to reclaim by focusing attention on ordinary political activity of people to say that this is, uh, we can reclaim some sense of uh, politics in the ways that people are able to create solidarities. So I'll, I'll stop there, Deborah, if that's okay, and, and we can take some more questions if people have them. Thank you. Thank you very much for those uh, thoughts. Um, yeah, it's an interesting interplay between what you might think of as possibly quite negative views of, you know, the rise of populism seen at a macro scale on the one side, and then the kinds of detailed interactions that you're describing on the other, which, which Professor Das was talking about. So there's a wonderful balance between quite sort of often, often quite paradoxical things coexisting here. Um, yeah, so I'd like to ask people if they would like to ask any questions. Uh, we have one in the chat so far, but let me ask people if they'd like to put their hands up using the, the reaction bubble um, or otherwise just wave them at me. I can't really see very well. Um, so yeah, using the hand raising thing would be good. And um, we'll try and collect a few and see. Oh, so we've got one from John Harris. Hi, John, nice to see you. Hello, John, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I, I'm unmuting. Um, 
Oh. Can't seem to start the video, but that doesn't matter. <laughs> we have uh, a tantalizing you, glimpse you, of you. You can do without yeah. seeing me. Uh, uh, I have a, a, a rather sort of basic kind of question, um, which is about the, you know, you emphasized, uh, emphasized so much, uh, you know, democratic values being uh, created as much in non-political moments as in political ones. But I thought, you know, as you'll perhaps understand, I, I thus far have concentrated in my reading, particularly on the, on the harvest uh, chapter for fairly obvious reasons. And there I feel that the values that you're talking about as being, uh, as being fostered in, in the harvest are actually predicated upon the earlier sort of political moment um, of the agrarian reforms uh, that uh, were, you know, carried through uh, by the uh, by, by the left front, um, and and so and I, I felt rather the same when I got you know reading the conclusion as well, that it it does seem to me that actually the the political moments are are really very very fundamental to the uh, to the the culture the values that. Uh, that you're that you that you're talking about. Anyway, that's uh, that was that was my reaction to, uh, uh, particular as I say to the to the harvest chapter. Oh, there I am. Oh, I see you. <laughs> Hi. Nice to see. You. Okay, Muki, is it okay if I collect a few more questions first, sure, or would you okay. like to answer them one by one? Sure. No, uh, I could I could answer John's question very okay. quickly. Go for it. I have to say, because, you know, John's work is so central to uh, my understanding of land reform, to the harvest and to values. So I'm you know, really happy that you've uh, engaged with it. And, I, and I've thought so much about it, John. And I, I think somewhere, you know, we probably have different readings of, of what is going on on the ground, because my sense from institutional interventions such as land reform and as i said uh, wage labor increases etc is that it is quite if you didn't know these people as well as i did it they're almost uh, so micro these changes that you wouldn't know what is being redressed but you know it is important because people then are delighted when you notice it Right. Mm -hmm. So they are big. So the fact that Okodom, who is a uh, who is a dome, a low caste, uh, Borgadar, a sharecropper, uh, agricultural worker and sharecropper, talks to his Sayyid landowner who owns the land, uh, you know, giving him commands and makes eye contact with him rather than looking at the ground is radical in that setting until a generation or half a generation ago when Okodom's father was the sharecropper if he was on a cycle he had to dismount on the cycle off the cycle when passing a, a upper caste man the fact that caste relations can be so radically reoriented because of uh, interventions such as the kind that were so imperfectly you know and there I completely agree with you that Operation Barga is a very imperfect program. But in this village where it seemed to have worked, it the knock-on effect is massive. So I'll leave Okay. It. Thanks, Muku. Um, so I'm going to, so Rachana Bajpal. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, that's been a great session. I'm sorry my uh, video is not working at the moment. Uh, it's given me so much to think about and certainly my tribe of political scientists have much to learn, I think, from uh, from doing what Professor Das was saying, which is to go beyond the sort of macro level generalizations, whether, you know, the quantitative or the conceptual level. My questions were, I had a couple of quick questions, which were really things which I myself am trying to think through. And they come from ignorance in that I haven't read the book yet. I am really looking forward to, can't wait to read it. And the questions were about how you relate conceptually the political and the democratic. And that comes from uh, one, uh, a certain 
um, uh, inflation of the category of uh, both of both the political and the democratic that has happened in the literature on in radical democracy, for instance, if we think of the work of Laclau and Mouffe, uh, there is very little distinction that is observed in uh, in works that then translate uh, 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 this uh, this into. Uh, into ethnographic or other work, sometimes that can be a problem. And so I was wondering whether and how you've addressed uh, this issue. And it, re it relates to the Republican and democratic issue and how you, know, you can have non, as it were, inclusive rep republics as well, et cetera. But um, the second question was how you see, and that's in relation to the dominance of the party. And it's really interesting, the relationship between hegemony and democracy. And uh, at one level, one can address it in terms of the conditions of possibility. So if we're looking at sociological conditions, did the hegemony of um, uh, the party enable certain <laughs> conditions for uh, democratic subjectivity within or the kinds of democratic subjectivity that uh, one has observed, I'm uh, assuming it in this setting, and what does the breakdown of that hegemony then mean? And uh, for somebody who knows nothing about or has not done any field work in West Bengal, but has tried to say follow politicians and elections in say Gujarat and UP, the party just doesn't, isn't significant in the everyday life, except that with the BJP, certainly it's, that has changed in Gujarat, although uh, not everywhere else. So what, uh, can you, could you say a bit more about the dominance of the party and how, uh, it can be both democratic and non-democratic. I'll stop there. That, that sounds quite complicated. So maybe you'd like to respond, Muku. <laughs> <laughs> that is complicated, but it's always thoughtful in a way that Rochna is and uh, um, challenging. Um, uh, you know, on, on Laclau and Mouffe, let me just say, uh, Rochna, if you read chapter seven, you will you will be a very good reader for chapter seven. I hope you will, um, uh, because I try and address this issue head on. Um, I am expanding um, the notion of democracy through expanding the notion of the political by saying you know, drawing very much on Jonathan Spencer's work, whom uh, I know you read him too, uh, on on expanding on the notion of of what he calls the counter political, or what Rosenvallon calls counter democracy, of the reparative nature of other kinds of politics that is not competitive, that's not agonistic, and I think you need both of them because you, the reason you need both of them is because a social anthropologist will always say this to you because we study societies and we study communities. And if you write only about agonisms, you can't explain how communities hold together. So if you have to have a theory of community, then you have to have a, a, a theory of politics that is more expansive than agonism. So th I'll leave it at that. And um, I'm delighted that at least we are neighbors and we can continue this conversation um, uh, in the future. On uh, hegemony and, and uh, democratic subjectivity, I'm not sh completely sure I understand you, but it does, your question allows me to, uh, you know, say something which also Thomas was asking about earlier, which was that, you know, what happens when you get this kind of BJP kind of for all non-Indianists here, the BJP is the ruling party in India. It is uh, it is very much a hegemonic Hindu um, nationalist party of chauvinism. Um, and also, it's not just that. It's not just about a certain kind of political ideology. For the purposes of this discussion, it is a party that has systematically destroyed democratic institutions. Systematically. That's been its agenda from day one. And so for all my friends, I'll, I'll just throw this in because I wanted to say this today that, you know, for all those people who wonder why I was obsessing about elections and I and took them so seriously that I'm glad I did because at least elections in those days in you know, 2009 was when the team of 12 of us studied uh, the 2009 Lok Sabha elections, which resulted in why India votes. The next Lok Sabha election 2014 onwards, things have been extremely distorted in India. So elections no longer are 
uh, what they are. Can you have a non-inclusive republic? Well, that's exactly what the agenda of, of a party like the BJP is about. It is precisely about creating a non-inclusive democracy. Philosophically, the way we are using the term republic, if it is premised on the idea of active citizenship, which means that you cannot cast a vote at an election and then go to sleep in between elections and wonder when you wake up at the next election why there is complete mayhem in the country, uh, then um, it, it doesn't work. There is no non-inclusive. Republicanism or republic, Republican citizenship requires you precisely to be inclusive. Uh, it requires you precisely to uh, actively recreate the imagination of the diverse citizenship, say in India's case, of the kind of constitutional vision of India that, that has been uh, put forward. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Muku. I'm going to now, um, there's a couple of, of questions in the chat. I'm just going to put them to you and see if you have any responses. Um, one of them is from Vidya Venkat and says, how does Mukulika view the work of journalists on the ground writing about elections and how does this contrast with the analysis anthropologists have to offer on the subject? Any journalist work you find particularly useful while writing the book? That's one of them. And the other one up, up above is from Sushmita and she says, does the Muslim migration from Bangladesh change the political mix and how? So I don't know if you've got any comments on that. But in the meantime, we can see if anyone else has put their hands up. Well, quickly, I think, uh, Sushmita, the, uh, yes, Bengal, as you know, has a much higher than national average of uh, Muslim population uh, and always has done. So Muslim uh, presence in Bengal is numerically significant, but also politically significant. The, the division of partition of Bengal right at the beginning of the 20th century, then again in 1947. And then what happened in 1971 is it's an ongoing story. And every time and now with, say, the CAA or NRC, um, every wave of such uh, institutional change on India's borders or India's notions of citizenship has a knock-on effect um, on, uh, on what's happening uh, in, in politics, of course. Uh, Lexi Stadlin has just left. She has a new book coming out on, um, on the Sundarbans and a Muslim community there and what... Um, uh, and what happens, you know, even not just with partitions and political events, but even with cyclones and, and what knock effects it has on, on the dynamics. Uh, Vidya, Vidya, your question is a naughty one because you know exactly what I'm going to say. <laughs> um, but I will say it nevertheless. Um, I think if you're going to, as a journalist, only go and study societies during elections to understand politics, well, uh, you know, I will your it's worth the paper it's written on for the day that it is published and then you know it goes into the bin because or it's recycled because it is capturing what is happening that day it is not it doesn't have an analytical explanatory uh, force but that's why good journalists are often on the ground uh, as you are uh, in non-electoral moments and they are the ones who are likely to explain what's happening during a campaign why people are why people in Western UP didn't vote that enthusiastically, for instance, last week uh, than otherwise. I'll, there's one lovely anecdote that um, that that is worth repeating here, which um, uh, is there in Why India Votes. And I said it was a 12, team of 12 of us who did that work. And my colleague who worked in Eastern UP, the way UP is so big, we had two for UP, in Eastern UP, Badri Narayan, Badri had this wonderful story, which uh, was about the importance. I use it as an example for the importance of listening to what people say about politics and what they actually do. So while he was talking to this woman one day, just uh, on polling day, he was going around you know, various areas and in the villages that he knew well and chatting with people. And there was this woman by the well, and she was washing clothes, big pile of clothes, and she'd been washing them. and. Um, then she finished, you know, and she was, there was a complete tirade about politicians, how awful they were, they were venal, they were corrupt, they did nothing for her, their lives were, they were, you know, morally depraved, etc, etc, everything that you'd expect. And all this time she sat there, she finished washing her clothes, and she sat and shone her silver bangles, you know, with soapy water and got them 
shining and so on and she kept and she sort of put all this anger and frustration into what she was doing while she was talking to Madhuri. Now, if you're a journalist, you would have written this, watched this, had this conversation. I have done field work. I have gone into the field. I have talked to women in Western UP, Eastern UP, and they're very angry with politicians and not going to vote. And you would have left, right? Badri, being an, uh, a social scientist and an anthropologist, stayed on. And then he went to the polling station later in the day. Guess who was in the queue to vote? The same woman with those very shiny silver bangles. And this kind of proves that you know, people will tell you things when you ask them questions. City folk like us, whatever clothes we wear, whatever we say, we will always stand out. They always know you're an outsider. And people say things to journalists that they think they want the journalists to hear. Uh, what they actually do, never mind what they think. I mean, that's a whole different ballgame. But even what they actually land up doing, whether they go to vote, who they vote for, who they support, do they attack other parties, etc. You really have to be there to watch it and, and, and observe it and write about it. Um, and that's, that's what's different between being an anthropologist and being a journalist. Thank you. Great. Well, um, so many, so we, we've seen more or less come to the end of our event and it's really been fantastic to hear all about the book and it's really, really huge thanks to Thomas and, and Dina for giving us the interesting and quite contrasting views of it. And I think Mukalik is going to have quite a lot of things he's going to have to think about and write a sort of second book about quite soon in order to respond <laughs> to all of this. I'm not writing any more books. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much to all of you. And, and it was a fantastic event. Thank you very much. If anyone can stay on, you're very welcome to. Deborah, can we, you can stop yeah. recording if you want, and then maybe we can... Do you mind okay. leaving the link That's fine. live? Because yeah, I'll, I'll, like do that. I'll do that. I'll do that.